Welcome back to Business Week. I'm joined now by Dr. Juliet Ehimwen, a renowned tech industry leader with over 25 years experience, including a remarkable 12 years at Google, primarily as director for West Africa. She established and expanded Google's presence in Nigeria and the wider region, and is a respected thought leader, coach, and advocate for personal excellence and leadership. She was named by Forbes as one of the top 20 power women in Africa by the London Business School as one of the 30 people changing the world. So great to have you with us on the show today, Dr. Juliet. I I believe it's your first time on Business Week. It is yeah. actually. So Great really, really thrilled to have <laughs> you. So of course, tech is your thing. So I'm glad that we're talking through a couple of tech stories. Sure. The first story we're discussing is SoftBank Group, mm -hmm. which is acquiring increasing its equity stake uh, in Arm, the British semiconductor manufacturer. Yes. So what's the significance of this particular deal? Yes, so I think this is uh, certainly great news for everyone involved. Um, VF1, which is Vision Fund, a $100 billion investment fund. Uh, it represents great return on investment. It also shows the you know, continued uh, increasing demand for uh, these technologies. Uh, just to give some, uh, a bit of a backstory. So um, SoftBank acquired ARM in 2016 yeah. for $32 billion. Mm. And then a year after, in 2017, it sold uh, to the 25% stake that it's looking to uh, acquire back now to uh, VF1 mm -hmm. for $8 billion, representing the same valuation of $32 billion. Mm -hmm. And um, a month from now, it's looking to take um, uh, arm to the NASDAQ. Okay with a valuation of 60 to $80 billion. That's a whooping increase. Which is, yeah, which yeah. is double yeah. its value in about seven years. Mm. That's a, an average growth rate of about 14%. Yeah. That represents great return. And um, interestingly as well, last year, mm. SoftBank had attempted to sell mm. ARM to NVIDIA, which mm. is also a cheap uh, manufacturing organization, uh, valued at over a, a trillion dollars, mm. actually. Uh, but that fell through because of antitrust regulations yeah. from the U.S. and Europe, which is understandable because you know Nvidia is in the same in, in the same space. So it's it could one have of resulted in one big exactly, mammoth of a company. Exactly, yeah. and a lot of the technology um, that ARM uses is also used in the in the core of the uh, processor, te processor yeah. technology of NVIDIA and other organizations like that. And so it would be an unfair advantage mm. for NVIDIA to be able to control the uh, industry in that way. So that fell through. And uh, it would have been a good deal for mm. NVIDIA because they were going to acquire at $40, million, $40 billion. Right. Now the valuation is 60 to, 80, uh, 60 to $70 billion. And mm. um, given that SoftBank as well has had some setbacks right. <laughs> in the last few years mm. with some of its investments like WeWork, uh, it's uh, definitely a breath of fresh air. And, yeah. Um, yeah, it is. It's very interesting because you always wonder how investors know what is going to be a good deal and yes, what is not right, going to be a right, good deal because right. tech is obviously a high growth area. So, yes. of course, we wish them the very best with that. Absolutely. Um, another story focusing on tech is fintech. MasterCard is buying MTN's fintech unit um, for $5.2 billion, like, wow. You know, what is MasterCard's, what is driving MasterCard? I mean, we know FinTech is big, but what do you think the main driver of this deal is? Oh, I think it, it, this, the deal makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. right? So if you think about um, the opportunities around mm -hmm. payments, mm -hmm. right, and the increased advantage you have with mobile platforms, mm -hmm. you can see a situation where, you know, one of the largest uh, payment companies in the world Right, bringing their platform, uh, you know, there can be a lot of synergies around encryption technologies, mm. around uh, you know security, risk mitigation, and all that. And then you know, leveraging uh, MTN's mobile technology and platform and reach, right? Because um, uh, you know, being able to uh, handle transactions anywhere, anytime, that flexibility and portability, which you have mm. with your payment card. But taking that one step beyond, uh, beyond that, I think it's going to be um, you know, a powerful force and one can see a lot of um, uh, complementarity. What is also interesting is the valuation. Mm. So $5.2 billion, mm. right? Uh, the market cap of MTN at the moment, MTN Group, mm. is uh, over $12 billion. Yeah. So $5.2 billion is quite a significant it is. number. That's right? almost half of the value exactly. of the market cap. Yeah. Exactly. And so it just really speaks to the increasing demand and uh, you know, relevance and need for um, uh, 
payment, payment systems. Mm. You know, fintech has been growing. Um, when you look at investments in the tech startup landscape, a huge pro uh, proportion of that investment has gone to fintech organizations. And also, you know, it's really combining the power of mobile technology mm. with the need, right, a real need, which is around financial inclusion. Yeah. Because um, May this year, round about May this year, the CBN mentioned that, you know, financial inclusion in Nigeria was at about 64% right, as opposed to a target 70%, which in itself is still, mm. you know, um, it still means that you have at least 30% of yeah. the population unable to ac access financial services. And so if you look at that as a percentage of the overall population, there's a huge demand. Yeah, but so don't, don't see... you actually think there's probably a now a plethora of fintech companies right. in the market? And we know we've heard stories that some of them don't really make it past year two or three. So, you know, how can investors even determine what is potentially a good deal with these fintech companies? Yes. So, um, that can be said for all startup companies. Yes, right? of the course. Fact that a lot of them don't survive beyond two years or even uh, a fewer get to the five year mark. Mm. Um, but talking about fintech in particular, uh, talking about the plethora of fintech organizations, there is a real need, mm. right, that these organizations are meeting. And if I just uh, zoom into Nigeria, at the moment, uh, it may interest you to know that we have about 250 fintech companies in the country, mm -hmm. right? That may seem like a large number, depending on your vantage point. Mm. But if we put that number in context, in, the, in India, another emerging market, you have a ratio of one fintech to just over 210,000 people. Okay. In the US, it's one fintech to about 40,000 people. Mm. And in the UK, it's one fintech to about 27,000 people. Yeah. In Nigeria, that number represents one fintech to over 740,000 oh, people. Oh, wow. Right? Wow. So okay. putting that in context, you see that it's we not need more saturated. We need more. Yeah. But of course, you know, there's a whole ecosystem involved, right? This is not, um, it, it's a web of activity. So, you know, infrastructure, skills development, mm. and a number of things need to come together in yeah. the ecosystem for that potential demand to be addressable. Absolutely. But um, it also speaks to just the, the importance of um, leveraging technology solutions mm. to meet real needs, you know, financial mm. inclusion and other needs that we see around our yeah. society. Yeah, indeed. I mean, MTN clearly has done well with that unit for it to be valued at this. And good luck to MasterCard. And now I'm making quite a bold move. So. Speaking of fintech and technology, we've had the ministerial portfolios, mm -hmm. which were finally announced, and I think a lot of us have been waiting for this. Um, what particular appointments have piqued your interest, and what is the significance of finally getting these portfolios assigned after so many weeks and months of waiting? Sure. So uh, the admis this administration is um, just over two months old, mm -hmm. and it's great to be able to see the people that mm -hmm. would be stewards mm -hmm. of the various arms of government and one of the appointments that piqued my interest is in, in, in my space, the tech space, and that's okay. the minister for comms and the digital economy, Dr. Bosun Tijani, because we have someone who is from the industry. Mm -hmm. He was involved in incubating businesses, so he understands the challenges of mm. tech printers. Uh, he understands the ecosystem quite well. We've seen a lot of growth in um, in the tech space, that growth is going to continue. And having someone who has uh, you know, a deep understanding of the space can really help to accelerate that growth in terms of creating the right enabling policies, in terms of ensuring that you know, the right levers are present to mm. stimulate and sustain that growth. Yeah, and what do you think his priorities should be? Because it, the digital economy is quite a broad area. Yeah. It can enable so many other different sectors. So what would you say his top priorities should be? Yeah, so increasingly, the digital economy is becoming a strong contributor to the overall economy. Mm. And if you look at the top um, the, the largest companies around the world, the top 10, most of them are, you know, tech companies. And uh, also when you look at foreign direct, direct investment into the country, um, while you see a decline in investment into other areas, uh, investment in the tech space has been growing. Mm. So the digital economy is a force to reckon with, mm. and it's really the marketplace for digital goods and services, right? right? And there are three things that I think are really critical. One is just enabling access. Okay. And then this is for entrepreneurs or no, no, in general, in terms of investors, so talking yeah. about, uh, you were, you know, asking about the minister and, and some priorities, yeah. right. Uh, to enable growth of the overall digital economy. Okay, right. So Understood. enabling access, making mm. sure that, you know, more people are able to, um, 
get online, okay. right? They have connectivity. Uh, it's it's more affordable, it's more reliable and more widespread. Okay. Looking at innovative ways to stimulate that, you know, from satellite-based uh, uh, innovations like, you know, we, we've seen you know, Starlink coming into the market and others as well, uh, ensuring that there's a space for, there's regulation to support diversity in innovation, mm. you know, from laying cables to, you know, satellite technologies, just a broad plethora because it's not a one size fits all. Of course. There are different solutions from a cost perspective, from a, um, a, a reach perspective, right, that would need to be deployed to ensure that mm. we have wide coverage as much as possible. So a lot of initiatives around that uh, on the access uh, place. And then the digital economy is, is a marketplace of digital products and services. So, you know, making sure that we can stimulate the production of those services, right? Supporting locally. Locally, absolutely. Okay. So supporting local tech startups, for example, right? Mm. Local businesses, supporting the, you know, creation and uh, deployment of um, local content, mm. right? So because this is making sure that there are use cases for people to engage, right? And reap the benefits mm. because if I'm able to uh, you know, get a loan with my fintech app, that's an incentive for me to go online and get that. If there's e-learning on an uh, edutech platform that I can access on my phone, that's an incentive mm. for me to do that. And then the third piece is just really skills development yeah. because we need developers that are able to build uh, these solutions. We need people to know how to use this, these platforms, which is why, um, you know, I, 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 during my time at Google, we invested in training, uh, providing digital skills training at scale. Mm. And also you heard the headlines this week around, mm. uh, you know, skills development. So those will be yeah. uh, important things. We need to ensure digital skills are part of our school curriculum. Of and people are able yeah, to Yeah, and in fact, if skills. you saw in my newsread earlier, I'd mentioned Google's initiative in Kaduna State. So yes. we're still talking on technology. China has introduced uh, artificial intelligence regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the first to look at that. I know we're running out of time. So very briefly, is this going to usher in just a swath of regulations clamping down on artificial intelligence? Or do we risk throwing out the baby with the bathwater? Well, yeah, so there's, there's been a lot of debate around artificial intelligence because it has moved in leaps and bounds. Initially, we had you know, prescriptive technologies, which mm. we were excited about, the ability for systems to be able to recognize patterns in data mm. and you know, provide some prescriptions, right? Decision-making without human intervention in that context. Now we've moved into generative AI. Yeah, which is a more controversial <laughs> which is a, which one, is, right? Exactly, which is another level, right? And um, I was going to ask you whether it's really Juliet sitting in front of me or deep fake technology. <laughs> well, there you go, you will never know. <laughs> but yeah. So there are lots of concerns around, you know, ethics, around mm. the impact on our human lives. You know, ChatGPT mm. was launched um, in November last year. It, it grew mm. really fast and a lot of people are really amazed at the possibilities, what it can do. And, you know, it's important to really think about what that means for us as uh, human beings. But just very quickly for, I think, um, in Africa, mm. um, artificial intelligence represents a huge opportunity for us to um, accelerate growth. I often say that our challenges are not going to be solved by traditional methods of the past. Yeah. Because these systems provide a way to handle these challenges more cost effectively and, um, um, and faster when you think about financial inclusion, when you think mm. about climate change, when you think about education at scale, you know, when you think about technologies that can provide, you know, remote diagnostics, telemedicine, and the fact that there is a shortage of doctors in a lot of our communities. You know, when you start to think broadly about the possibilities, we realize that we should lean in to it, to, mm. to artificial intelligence yeah. and be part of shaping the narrative and the policies. Yeah. You know, the last uh, industrial revolutions, we were playing catch up for the most part. But this is an opportunity for us to lean in and be at the front of shaping of the course. direction. Hopefully the Minister of Digital Economy is listening. And I hope the regulators will, will think through how they regulate in such a way that enables the growth in a positive manner. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Juliet Ehimwan. Great to have you on the show. Thank it's been you. a pleasure.